What was your first startup called again? Ariba. Uh, Ariba. <laughs> Hi guys, we're here today with Colette. She is the Chief Innovation Officer at Blue Chili. Blue Chili is based in Sydney and is a startup and innovation studio. And we're going to talk about how to pitch your startup idea, why to pitch your startup idea, to whom you pitch your startup idea, and lots more. So stay tuned. Say hello, Colette, to the audience of 10 or 10 thousands of people. 10 thousand. 10 people or 10 thousand, we'll see. <laughs> so I actually have known Colette for quite a while and it's been very inspiring to follow her journey. And we're sitting here today to give you guys a little bit more of advice on how you can pitch your startup idea to accelerators, incubators, investors, I think, um, Colette, with how many startups have you worked and how many pitches have you heard so far in your life? Oh my God, I try to count this and I think I have personally sat through over 500 pitches. So I have heard a lot of pitches. Okay, cool. So let's let's just start in the beginning. How okay. did you get to Blue Chili? Yeah. Where the, I, I know you're not from Sydney, but no, neither, neither am I. So yeah, how did you get here in the first place? Yeah. So let's just all go back to... I guess the beginnings of your Sydney journey even though I think your startup career kind of it started before that yeah. right I've always thought about the fact that it's much easier to make sense of things when you look backwards so you go oh of course this is where I ended up and you can justify all the steps looking back um, but the scary and the exciting thing is that wherever you're standing right now wherever you are in your life right now you have no idea what's ahead of you um, so you can only I think do what feels right um, and I think this is why it's so important for you to pursue your passions um, because you have no idea where they're going to lead you and you're going to justify it wherever you end up anyway so just go for it so um, let's go right into that then <laughs> let's justify your journey how you got to where you got so yeah so testament to how anybody can become an entrepreneur I was born in South Africa um, I did not think I was ever going to be uh, working in innovation or working with startups, working with tech. That was not something that I thought about at all. I was born in, um, and I grew up in a small town in South Africa, the equivalent of Proserpine, if you've ever been there in Queensland. There's like sugarcane fields. There's nothing. There's an airstrip. So that's where I'm from. Um, and later on in life, I went on a, 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 a international journey, you know, as a lot of people do. I was working, I took some time off, and I, I started traveling. And as we were traveling through Central America, cycling and camping through all the rural areas, we discovered that there was a real big gap in the travel space, um, and we started working to fix that. Um, so my husband and I accidentally started a startup. He came in one day, we were back in Brisbane, and we started working on this thing, um, and he comes, babe, I read a blog, and I think what we're doing is called a startup. Amazing. <laughs> that's how that's how one becomes a startup entrepreneur is you by not knowing that you're actually doing it. I think if you had to tell me, do you want to go and start a startup or do you want to be an entrepreneur? I'd be like, nah, sounds hard, right? But I was literally just working on something and really trying to find a solution because I really believe that it was a problem worth solving, and that's how I started my first uh, my first startup. Um, we learned a lot on that journey. Yeah. yeah, we learned uh, so much. And one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give to, to um, people who are starting their own companies is go back and figure out what success looks like for you, like what a viable, successful business looks like, not the billion-dollar exit, but what does it look like in a year? What does it look like when you have to pay three people salary? You know, how much money do you actually have to generate to do that? And work backwards from there and set up your metrics month by month mm -hmm. and go, if, if we need to generate, you know, $100,000 or $500,000 or a million dollars to survive, then it means that this month we need to do this, this month we need to do this. And then you start building out your metrics and you go, what are the biggest levers that are going to make that a success and work backwards from that mm -hmm. um, and then track them diligently and be sit down with somebody external, sit down with a mentor or an advisor 
and look at those numbers and have them question you and drill you into why you didn't achieve them. Because if you don't do that, then it's very easy to lie to yourself and to buy into all the hype of like, I'm a founder and I have a company. It doesn't generate any revenue and it's never going to survive, but I'm a founder. Oh, I think, um, I mean, I've made that mistake uh, mistake in the early days. You know, you just want to build something. You don't even think about revenue. You're just like, oh, one day, you know, you can monetize it later. But you should think about it from day one. Do you think Um, that being a startup founder and actually drawing the inspiration for your startup from your own problem, is that a good thing? I think especially for first-time founders, it's not that it's a good or a bad thing, it's a natural thing Mm. because it's a space that you understand, it's a problem that you understand, it's a very easy way to get started. I mean, if somebody said your first, if somebody said to me, your first startup should be a space, you know, startup, Uh, yeah. Maybe you're an astronaut, though. Well, maybe if I were, I would have done it. But I wasn't. I was a traveler. And that's how yeah. I got started. Yeah, but take what? us back to, to your experience, I guess, um, from traveling. And what was the main problems that you experienced when you were traveling? And you couldn't find, I assume, you couldn't find the solution anywhere. Yeah. So we were specifically looking at traveling and how centralized traveling was creating a really bad experience on both the traveler and on the local side, where um, everybody would come in, they would wake up at dawn, they would climb the mountain, they would take the Instagram shot, and they would get down and leave, right? And it was this very, it created a, um, a very almost like a centralized funnel for everybody to just experience the world in one way, and it didn't actually create connections. Yeah. And if we really wanted to have people care about the world, um, sustainability and the environment is a big thing for me, then we would have to get them to care about the people. And if you don't have that opportunity Mm -hmm. to really connect with the local in anything other than a commercial transaction, you weren't actually experiencing the place for what it was. Um, So we started looking at what were all these sort of like um, underground activities that you could do um, that weren't just climbing the bridge or Mm -hmm. climbing the mountain, but they were, you know, going out and trying the cupcakes or finding the best blues bars or, um, or you know, going on a photography tour uh, specific to something that you were passionate about and that the local was passionate and knowledge about and that you could come together and um, share that passion over that experience. Fast forward a little bit. Um, so um, how long were you guys working on it? And yeah. I also, I would, I'd love to actually ask, how is it to work with your partner, boyfriend back then husband husband now husband back then too husband back then too oh my god well okay husband back then as well so how is it to have a business with someone that you see every day and that you wake up next to and actually kind of spend every single single minute yeah uh, which, Would you which recommend question, it? Which question do well, you want me to answer first? Is, the question is, um, what are the benefits and what may be the downsides? Down. Yeah, so um, first off, we're still married. We're good. We got this. Um, business didn't survive, though. Um, I think there's, it's, it can go either way, right? Because it becomes to a certain point when you have nothing else to talk about except mm. the business. Um, So I think if you are going to be doing a business with your significant other, make sure that you're disciplined about setting time aside when you don't talk about the business. Mm. For example, you know, once a day when you're making dinner, that is time when you're not talking about the business. You're not allowed to talk about it. You have to find something else to talk about. Or setting, you know, designated time aside from that because I think it's very easy to get drawn up and only have that in common. And um, the upside is, you know, when it's amazing success, of course, it's, you know, testament to you guys being an amazing couple, right? Um, Or when the business isn't doing so well, it's very easy to start picking on each other as Mm -hmm. to why it isn't going well. And you have to have those clear boundaries. And this is especially difficult to do for a startup at the early stage because you are your startup. Um, And it's a fine line that you're working between, you know, are you a success or is your startup a success or are you a success and your startup is a failure? Mm. You know, and I think that when you're actually, when you throw yourself into a startup and you commit yourself to doing it, irrespective of the outcome of the startup, you're going to be a success because you're investing that uh, learning and you're investing that experience into yourself. So you will never fail as a person irrespective of whether your business fails. 
I like that. It's it's really important to address really because I think advice. I think for a lot of people when they come out the other side, especially if they if it's especially on the first time, you know, ninety percent of startups fail. Yours isn't going to be any different, right? You might be the ten percent. Chances are ninety percent you're going to be the failure, right? To not take that personally as a knock on yourself, and I think when we're talking about a lot of the issues around you know mental um, instability and the pressures that that founders are putting on themselves and the um, the pressure. And under you know that that causes them to crack has to do with people thinking that them as if as a human and as an individual is the same as their startup mm. and it's not mm. it's not it's a learning process and it's not just about the outcome it is very much also about that process from what did you learn because when I'm looking at it um, as an entrepreneur pitching me and they tell me that they have had a failure but that they've learned from it that is actually a positive thing. I mean, I always think failures are there to to be made in order to every failure you you can learn so much. Wouldn't wouldn't you agree? Yeah, but but it's not. I, I actually hate calling it failure because it's not. It's, yeah, it's, it's not failure, not, but but it depends on the mindset, right? Yeah. If you're thinking about the only way that you, the only success of the business has to do with you know a revenue number or a success as a future outcome mm. that is very different than the success of the business has to do with was it properly run yeah because you can especially for true for startups that are testing new things that are trying things that have been not validated in the market yeah um, chances are it's like you don't know what success even looks like so stop chasing the future thing for what it looks like and really invest in making sure that you're doing things as properly and as thoroughly and that you're learning as much as you can because even if you achieve success without learning anything chances are you're going to fuck it up in the future Mm. because you don't have the fundamentals of what it took to get there Mm. yeah okay i mean from a from a ux perspective it's all about testing and measuring and learning because you do have an idea but you still have to validate it right so that's that's pretty much that's it it's a process yeah we focus so much on startups being the only measuring points for it is being like an exit or a raise or something versus the measuring point it's the same thing with the with ux it's like obviously you're trying to get to the end point of a design and something being beautiful and working but it's a constant process to iterate it right yeah it's about you know i mean it's all about setting up your metrics in the beginning and then how how do you get there so yeah. yeah Cool. Okay, so let's go back to your startup, which was called Arriba. Arriba. Oh, I didn't do it properly. <laughs> Arriba. <laughs> One more time. Arriba. <laughs> um, so, what were the? Okay, what what was for you guys the point where you said, okay, we're calling it a day? And what were the major learnings? Yeah, so we had a, a fantastic advisor who sat with us every month um, and sometimes more than once a month. And we, uh, he gave us the clear um, impetus that he would not sit down with us if we weren't talking about numbers. Mm. So we had to have a dashboard where we came up with the 10 key things, like the, uh, the key metrics that we had to measure because we knew that those were ultimately the things for the business model that we were working in that were going to uh, determine success for us. So, you know, it was to do with the the number of bookings. So it was a marketplace for local experiences, right? So the number of completed bookings, the number of... um, of hosts on the site and then therefore the number of you know travelers we needed to attract which then meant you know the number of views we had to get to the site um, and then the conversion rate all the way through but then also um, the the volume so the amount of, mm. of booking revenue and our percentage that we could take from it so I mean those are what well, it sounds so simple but when you actually have them on a one sheet spreadsheet and you go let's look at the numbers why did we not achieve them we knew what we had to achieve in 12 months because we said yeah. if we are to get to 12 months we know that we can't make a yeah. revenue sustaining yeah. business but what would we need from an investor point of view to get there what, and we didn't what were you who who um, decided on what numbers for example to focus on as in like how how especially I guess as a startup you know you're supposed mm-hmm. to grow you know you um, as you know like what does it even mean growth and um, like yeah. where do you measure it on especially if somebody wants to go and um, get 
funding, for example. Yeah. Um, pitching your startup idea has also to do with pitching your numbers, right? So yeah. how do you measure growth and what do you base it on? What do you base it on? It's different for every startup. Yeah. And that's why it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, and that's why my advice is to go out and find somebody in that industry or in that particular field who you can sit with. So what we did is we spoke to three, four different investors. Mm -hmm. At the time, we said, look, we're not looking for investment, but we want to know what is it going to take for you to give us investment in 12 months' time? What do you want to see? What will, you, what will give you confidence that we're actually on the right track? And then we triangulated all those mm -hmm. numbers and we went, okay, this is actually what it means. And then we had one key advisor who was also an investor yeah. um, who sat down with us and month by month we could talk through that because he had experience from doing a similar yeah. startup like that before. How did you select those investors? Were they all in the travel industry or were they no. experienced entrepreneurs? Or? They were experienced entrepreneurs and they were also from, so I know Nikki Sevak from Startmate yeah. um, and from Black uh, Blackbird sat down with us. Um, Rick Baker sat down with us. Yeah. Um, Dave Cunningham sat down with us, and he had experience doing a similar startup like that that he had exited. Mm -hmm. So we pulled from a number of different um, avenues. We also read a lot. We read a lot of blogs, mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, nobody can pick your numbers for you. You yeah. have to pick them, and you have to own them and be comfortable with them. But get advice and get external input. Yeah, you know when you're setting it up, because otherwise, how do you know if you're if you're making numbers up or not? So I guess that would be one of the first steps before you go out for funding is to actually just pitch the idea to get some general feedback. Oh my God, always be pitching. If you're an entrepreneur, your job is you are always on and you are always pitching. No excuses. So obviously, being in the startup in the startup scene, you come across sometimes entrepreneurs who are, who feel very protective of their ideas. What do you what do you say about that? That's sort of like you know a product without any marketing or without telling people is like winking at a girl in the dark. You know what you're doing. Nobody else does. Nobody else cares. Yeah. You have to tell people, and that's not saying that you have to give away your secret source. Um, and that's not saying that you have to give you a secret source to everybody, but you have to get feedback. I mean, if you can't tell your customers about your idea, then how are the fuck are they ever going to buy your product? Yeah. yeah. Going back to major learnings, what were your major learnings and when did you decide, okay, we're going to call it a day? My overall, my major learning was, you know, my startup failed. I am not a failure. It took a couple of months after shutting it down to really come to grips with that mm. and to really own that. Um, but it has, it's been something that has fundamentally changed my life. I have my life before startups and then after startups, um, and it has set me on a completely different direction to where I am today, which is where I'm really, really happy, and this is my space. Um, so I will forever be grateful for it, so I can never think bad about the experience. Um, that was my key learning overall. My other key learning was uh, measuring, so data mm -hmm. doesn't lie. Um, if you're being... Getting good advice about what you what you should be measuring and what good success looks like and what good traction looks like, but then be diligent and be cruel with measuring it and be honest with yourself and not being scared to get feedback from other people around around your non progress. Mm. Those are hard conversations, but like everything, it's in adversity that you grow. It's when you don't push your boundaries and you're not operating in a space where you're uncomfortable in is you're ch like you're probably not learning, right? And you always need to be learning. One thing I wanted to mention is because you did have your own startup, as you can easily put yourself into the shoes of startup founders now, right? And I mm -hmm. think that's probably one of your 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 strengths now as well that you know and you can identify with them, and they mm -hmm. can connect on that level with you. So yeah, yeah. and yes. <laughs> Yes. I said that very well, didn't I? I can't say that any better. Uh, I don't know if I actually got out of you. When did you call it a day? Now that we en entered the route of talking about startups, learnings, um, when do you actually call, call it a day? day? Because I find that I've, I've had a few startups myself and I always find it hard because you're quite attached to it. When do you actually make the business decision? Okay, you know what? We just have to, we have to move on. And um, even though yeah. it's hard and... yeah. Uh, so I'll, I can't tell you when you're going to have to shut your startup down, um, or if you're going <laughs> to. This really turned it into a negative <laughs> podcast, though. Yeah, it's a reality. Yeah. But I can't tell you if and when you might have to think about shutting yeah. it down. What was it for you, though? For what? us, the decision to shut it down, the meeting that we actually had between the the founders to do that took seven minutes. 
that's pretty fast. But the the decision took four months. Yeah. Right, and because we uh, so we started in September was when Finko came into the room and went, "Babe, I think we're doing a startup." And then we went, "Well, what does a startup do?" Well, a startup obviously gets a, a tech co-founder, and then you apply for an accelerator, and then you get into the accelerator, and then you get funding, and then you get an exit. Like, duh, who <laughs> who needs a program for that? <laughs> So, so we actually, literally, my next step, I started out that afternoon looking for a, a tech co-founder, mm -hmm. and we were incredibly lucky that we found somebody who had the same vision and was very much aligned, and we had a lot of other common interests. We've never met before, didn't know each other, and we said, well, we're applying for, for Startmate, and uh, can you please, uh, can you join our team, because we need a tech co-founder for this program. And he was just crazy, super talented, but really crazy, and he said yes. Um, and that's how we got started. And yeah. 14 months later, we shut down. Um, in the process, of course, you know, we got uh, people on, like we got a team involved, we got investment. Which um, makes it even harder. Which right? makes it even harder. But by the time that we shut down, we hadn't run out of money because we were very, very lean and very stingy with what we spent money on. Mm. Um, we had tested multiple iterations, like multiple different business models, multiple different, you know, go to market strategies, acquisitions. We knew what our acquisition cost had to be because we had that dashboard that we built with, a, you know, it's just an Excel sheet, right? Right? Yeah. But we knew what the, the lifetime value of a customer was based on the experiments that we ran. So therefore, we knew what the acquisition cost had to be for us to make a profit on that. Um, so we had all the numbers there, and we were just continuously trying different things to get to something that when you modeled it out over the next two years was actually a viable business. Hmm. And we couldn't. So for the last four months, we were doing like intensively you know, more experiments and trying different models and the, I remember the last meeting with with our advisor and he said look I I really don't know what to tell you guys because I think you actually tried everything I don't think there's anything else that I can say hey you left the stone unturned but we, the the key to getting traction as a startup is how many iterations can you do how fast yeah right and then what do the results mean are they are they do they tell you that there's confidence to continue doing that and experiment more and and put more money into that or do they tell you you should look at a different avenue and when you've explored all the avenues for a particular business, then the data technically tells you that you should, you know, take a step back and explore a different business. Yeah, right? yeah. So, um, so even though it took a couple of months, we were very much monitoring that on a daily basis and going, is this going the right way? And can we see that this is going to be something that we can, you know, give up our lives for? And, and the answer was no. When I look back, like at the time, there's a tendency to go, I have no idea what I'm doing. But when I look back, I actually went wow, we were really disciplined in what we were doing and we were just, we were actually doing it like a business. We weren't just doing that with all the hype. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think especially the measuring, I mean, it's so important and I think there are a lot of businesses out there, startups that haven't really, haven't really got to the whole part of that you need to define your metrics and that yeah. you need to work with that in order to grow your business. Yeah. Um, okay, so how did you end up here? We gotta, I'd love to talk to you <laughs> for hours, but you, I know you have a busy day and you have to run. So how did you get here? All right. How did you get here? <laughs> get here? So you know when I said that we're that uh, you know when I said that you just get a co-founder and then you apply to the accelerator and then I said you get into the accelerator. Well, we didn't. Uh, we made it to the shortlist. We got the interviews, but we never made it into the accelerator. And at the same time, there was a um, there was a startup accelerator that we again got rejected from that we're looking for a program coordinator. So. Yeah. We said, well, let's move to Sydney and I can do this job while we do the startup and yeah. really got connected into the, the startup community, which is a very valuable thing to do is to be able to tap into like-minded people, tap into their experience, have conversations, have those random meetings with people. And then, um, yeah, like I was, was running the startup and then I got asked to, once we shut Ariba down, to go and do a startup inside a corporate, so to do an internal innovation startup. Um, and I did that. And then I um, was chatting to Alan one day, the evangelist, the evangelist for Blue Chili, and uh, he was like, have you spoken to Seb? Because uh, I know Catherine's going on maternity leave, and she was the lead startup advisor, and he's like, I think you could probably cover for her while she's gone. But you stayed around, yeah. you stayed, so yeah. you enjoy, but what do you enjoy most working, working at Blue Chili now? The thing that I absolutely love most about working here is the opportunity. We live in a, a culture here where everything is possible. There is not a single reason why you can't do anything. Everything is possible. 
and you're given full autonomy to go and do that. So uh, when I started, Seb said, I don't run a daycare. I hire capable people, and then I give them a goal, and I get out of their way. And that has hold true, held true for the last three, four years, where um, every day you go, hey, this is actually going to help grow the business. Go forth and do it. Mm. Go forth and do it. And I find that, that is compl- that's really stimulating to be able to have to be able to be yeah. to share in the op- almost like yeah. a startup in a in a company like yeah. you have a lot of um, um, responsibility and um, you're trusted with your work yeah. and what you do. So, I have yeah. I have full autonomy to do what yeah. we need to do to get to the ultimate goal. So yeah. set the goal, and we all have autonomy to do what we need to yeah. do to get it there. And if you the opportunities for growth for myself, but also the opportunities for growth as a company, the things that we're doing. It's just, it's so amazingly cool. This mm. is like honestly the best place. I don't think I will work anywhere else. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So what are the top, I mean, what are the top, um, how to pitch your startup idea? So when are you ready to pitch? When are you ready to pitch? Always. You are, when you have the idea, you are pitching. Um, however, when you start progressing with the idea, there are two things that I think um, you need to know in terms of pitching. So pitching has two sides of it. It has um, the content or the, you know, the framework, and then it has the delivery, mm-hmm. right? So there's two different things, and we can talk about them because one of them you can learn, and the other one you just have to practice and pick up as you go. So frameworks you can learn. So what are some you know, pitch frameworks that you can learn that are going to help you get your idea across clearly and memorably? Because ultimately what you want is you want somebody to listen to what you're saying understand it and repeat it to somebody else because when there's one of you doing the marketing you need to be able to help other people help you market yeah and i think there are some really good templates on even like your pitch how to present your pitch because it's about telling your story and so on yeah. um, i might link to that in the description box so check it out as well yeah. but yeah so, so the frameworks i'll teach you a very quick one if you haven't heard about it it's called the gaddy pitch Ooh. oh you know the gaddy pitch come on okay so the Gaddy pitch works like this. Um, it has three parts. Part one. So you know how... Actually, give me... Let's do this. Okay. Give, me, give me an idea. Okay. Give me a crazy idea. <sighs> like, how crazy are we talking? I've pitched okay. like... Okay. Uh, crazy. Uh, be quick, be quick. Uh, a crazy idea. Okay, a headband that tracks my walk. Walking. A okay. fitness headband that tracks my walking. So a wearable for tracking your fitness. Yes. But I had it's, it's a well a, a headband or a hairband a like hairband elastic. elastic female female okay. target audience all right or men with long hair so really. you know how there are many wearables that help you track your fitness but all of them are really ugly and you can never match them to your outfits. Um, well, what we do is we've created a hairband, which you can just put in your ponytail when you go for a run. Nobody even notices that it's tracking anything. You don't have to tell people that you're trying to count your steps. Um, and in fact, we already have about 100 of them out on the market collecting data for um, some of the best people that you don't even know of. And how did you do that? Now you've got to go into ah. the technique. Right, so you see what I did there? It sounds good. Yeah. Okay. I- yeah, so I'll talk to you. Yeah, you've got one? <laughs> you know, no, no, I mean, like, this is amazing, like, making it up on the spot, but it sounds like, yeah, you've done it a lot. Yeah, I have done it a I lot. Have picked, I have pitched blue strawberries, which somebody gave me once, and then they also pitched me, they said, uh, organ organ harvesting. Yeah. They gave me organ harvest. Like, seriously? <laughs> Sick. Oh, wow. So, okay, so talk about the technique quickly, yeah. because I think, yeah, that's... Yeah. Uh, that's so the technique basically is uh, the Gaddy pitch is like it's a quick, easy way to get your idea across, right? So it's in three parts. So you know how, you know, you want to go for a run and you want to track your steps, but you don't want people to see that. What we just did there is we talked about the problem and we talked about it in a way that wasn't talking about it on some high level. We brought it back down to a user. So I looked at you and I went... I reckon that you are the type of person who likes to match your things. You're wearing some earrings, you're wearing some jewelry. So it probably matters to you what you look like, right? So your appearance matters. So I'm going to pitch it in a way of like, there's this hairband. Mm, Um, I didn't, I didn't talk about the technology or about how many microfibers are woven into it because you probably don't care, but you might care about how it looks or how discreet it is. Yeah. 
right? And I think that's an important message, by the way, that you adjust your pitch based on who you talk to, right? Yes. Because I think a lot of people are very sad. Oh, I can't. I, I don't know how many people, but I know that, I mean, I've done that before, that you're very set on you learn your elevator pitch. And it's always the same, no matter yeah. who you talk to. But it's but very it important. It's step one in this is to adjust your pitch. And when you have this framework, you can do this because all you've done is you've committed the steps of the pitch and then you adjust the content on the fly. And it works, honest to God, you can pitch this to different ways. So if you were to tell me that you're the head of like a tech company, I'd say, oh, so you know how you've been trying to develop a microprocessor that, you know, processes things in a fraction of a second from what you're currently doing? Well, what we do is we've built a technology with like 100 million fibers that actually pick up on like small vibrations and do that. In fact, we've put it into a headband And we, mm. you know, women are wearing this now when they're tracking their steps and that's how we yeah. collect the data to build the algorithm. Same thing. Same Completely thing. Completely different Completely pitch. different, right? Yeah. yeah. But that's how you can do it on the fly if you actually just learn the stage. So to come back, the three things you need to know about the Gaddy pitch is it works like this. So you know how and you talk about the problem. Well, what we do is you talk about the solution. In fact, jazz hands. <laughs> And the jazz hands is demonstrating traction and demonstrating that other people are using it. So see, I'm not crazy. Yeah. It gets buy-in. It shows people that it actually is viable. It's so it's alive. about credibility then step three as well. Would you say that? Or yeah. It's a, well, it's about, it's a little bit of, it's jazz hands, right? Yeah. So whatever the most um, impressive number it is, for example, and we already have a prototype or we already have 10,000 people using it or, you know, my mom says it's good, but I'll take it. Right? So whatever it is that the best thing is that you can talk about it, like we already have the best advisors on board. We've already spoken to 50 cus you know, potential customers. We've mm -hmm. already done 10 interviews. Whatever it is for the stage that you're at, use that mm -hmm. and frame it in a good way. So remember, so you know how, well, what we do, in fact. And the key is keep it short, keep it memorable. If you tell your grandma, your grandma should be able to repeat it to her grandmother friends. And they should understand it. Right? No matter how old your grandma is. Yeah. So that's, that's part one. That's the framework. So once you get the Gaddy pitch, then people go, fantastic, now I've got it. Like, I can retire. Where's my coconut and my, you know, cocktail on the beach, right? But really, what that's intended to do is just for people to go, ah, that's interesting. Let me introduce you to so-and-so because, mm -hmm. ah, and then they go, hey, did you know, well, what they do is, in fact, they've got like 10,000 people using it, right? Mm -hmm. And what you're trying to do is to get either the next meeting or the next step towards, you know, towards either somebody buying it or using it or whatever, whether it's a journalist or an investor or investing in it. Um, yeah. And what I find works really well is, uh, as a second part to that, is knowing what you're done doing to do. So what we've done so far is we've built this technology and da da da, da. What we're doing now mm -hmm. is we're building out the team and we're testing it in multiple pilots. Next up, we want to be doing this, uh, this uh, partnership with corporates. Like, in fact, can I come and talk to you and see if there's an opportunity to do this with your company? You know? So it's always about the next thing. You're always trying to get to, in fact, this is where we are. Great. Fantastic. Now let's talk about what's next. Yeah, I like it. It's about creating opportunities and actually not being too set on who you're, who you're going to, or who you want to end up with. It's about being open and pitching to different people, different yeah. pitches. And it's just this network, right? Yeah. People do introduce you to other people and you yeah. might end up somewhere completely different than you, you ever expected to, to, to end up in the beginning. So. Again, you can justify it looking back and be like, oh yeah, it's because I went to that party and pitched my crazy idea. Yeah always be pitching you never know it's happened to me before where I was just at a barbecue chatting to somebody you know and, were, and then I realized this is the person that I've been desperately trying to get a meeting with <laughs> like seriously and I just had that opportunity so you are always pitching you are never not off you're always telling people about your idea because you don't know who they are and you don't know who they know Good that's one. it <laughs> okay. you better start practicing you're night and day Yeah. To everyone. I think it's like, it's almost like rapping and freestyle. The more you practice it, the more you flow, right? And you might know something about rapping and freestyle. <laughs> yes, I do. Can you Not pitch so me your rubber band and rapping? <laughs> 
<laughs> Not today. Different, different talk. Yeah. So we talked about the Getty pitch and we also talked about your journey, even though we kept drifting off slightly here and there. <laughs> um, so I guess my question would be, when do you start to pitch to investors? When do you, do you think and, and, and a startup is ready to pitch to investors? And how would you pitch your startup idea what would you need to have? And I know, I mean, it's yeah. always depending on startup to startup, but what yeah. are the basics that you should have in place in order to go and seriously think about pitching for funding? Okay. So there are only two times when you are not allowed to pitch to investors. Okay. Number one is when you desperately need the money. Don't pitch investors then because mm -hmm. either it's too late or you're going to get a really bad deal. And number two is never pitch investors when you don't know what you're going to spend the money on. And this is why the early validation is so important. Like, how much can you test? Like, what have you tracked in a dashboard? Like, do you know what metrics you're actually looking at? Because what you really want to show an investor and what gives them confidence is when you go, for every dollar that I put in here, I'm going to spit a dollar thirty out. Mm. that's what you want to show them. Or for every dollar that I put in here, this is how it affects my magic metric. And if you can't articulate that, don't go and pitch an investor. General rule about investment, I guess. Um, what does an investor, as in growth, is it 10 times as much they, as they put in? Or? Different investors invest for different reasons. Some investors invest because they are only looking for you know, a 10x return. Other investors will invest in somebody because they go, you know what? I can see myself in that person. Like my 10, 10 years ago, I was that person and I want to help them support and grow through this journey. Um, other investors are impact investors and they're looking to see at what's the social impact of the investment that they're making. So not all investors are the same and um, you need to align your values and your company with the investors that you're looking for because once you take investment, you are beholden to your investors to deliver on that vision and on on what you promised them. So it's not just a quick way to get money. It's ve it's very serious to take investment on and it will fundamentally change your company and how you run it. So don't just take investment because every other startup does or it seems like every other startup does. The best people to take money from is your customers. So true. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this podcast today. Thank you so much, Colette, for, for taking your time out of your busy day. I really appreciate that. I think you learned a lot. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel for more startup talk. And I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Gurgic. Gurgic. Just go, Colette. Okay, I'm going to say Colette. <laughs>